in the late 80s, early 90s, London was a different place and were very few Nigerian, British Nigerians working in the city. Uh, London Bridge then was the city. There was nothing in Canary Wharf. It was all old warehouses back then. But for some reason, I just had this burning idea wanting to come back to Nigeria. And, and that I give credit to my mother because she always made sure we came back home every holiday. Christmas, you know, come back home. And I always supported her in her business, which was export of palm kernel cake, right? Palm kernel, crushed palm kernel cake. Because if you go back in the 80s, things became terrible in Nigeria. And for those with children in England, it was difficult to pay school fees, right? So you had to look for an export business that earns foreign exchange to support that. And that kind of got me. So I moved back and I thought, hmm, how do we optimize this business model and make it bigger? Then she used to ship out container loads. And I sat with a company then called PP Noor in Spain and a company called Dan Howe VOF in Amsterdam. And in talking to them, they, they wanted to buy more palm kernel produce from Nigeria, the cake. When you get the palm fruit, they pluck it, they take out the shells or the, the, the shaft around it, which is like this, and they squeeze that, that brings up palm oil. Then you're left with the seed. When they crack the seed, you have nuts inside. When they crush the nuts, they take out what looks like vegetable oil. It's called CPKO, they use it for soaps and stuff like that. When they refine it, that's part of veg olein you use in cooking. What is the residual of the crushing process is palm kernel cake. It's very high fatty and it's used in the compound feed mills in Europe, mixed with chemicals and things like oatmeals, things like soya bean meal, and that's what you see they feed chicken that blows up. And you've got a, from day old chick, in 10 days you have a whole chicken, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Companies like Sudit Oil and Chemicals in Ibadan, uh, Best Oil Industries in Ibadan, Ferdinand Oil in Onecha, Golambo Oil in Olu, so all over Nigeria. So we became the master of buying we started from doing containers into barge loads, then we started doing shiploads from Nigeria, from both Lagos and Port Harcourt. I got married in 97. My wife used to go to the port with me. It was fun. Um, so that's, that's how the business really kicked off. So I took the business and we wanted to grow it. We were very lucky. And, and this, um, I speak factually. With every idea you have, you also need an element of luck and timing. Don't let anyone fool you. There's so many people out there that work very hard. Right? The guy that works as a laborer works very hard, but he does not get the values out of it right? that we get. So you need that element of luck. Because so I don't want you thinking, oh, yeah, we've got this great idea. We've got this great spark. But hey, that luck needs to make it gel. Right? And, and that's what it was. So we started that, and that started growing. Danhauer is one of the oldest Dutch trading houses. This goes back 250 years. And they had a management buyout by Rolf, and they changed the name to Davoff. So Danhauer VOS, there's the DA, and the VOF at the end, so it became Davoff Trading. You could Google it, it's still going till today. So they decided to partner with us, and we formed a company together, 50-50. So two years as an entrepreneur, we had this joint venture that was just fantastic. It meant we had sleepless nights. Just imagine trying to collate palm kernel right across all these markets in Nigeria. And these are trucks. So the roads were not that bad then. So we're loading sometimes 20, 30 trucks a day. Each trailer takes 30 tons of palm kernel. So if we have a 5,000 ton vessel in a papa port, just do the sums. That's the amount of trucks that needs to be loaded to and from the port. So it was a lot of work, but it was fun. Um, so we built that, and from that, an opportunity came in again. We decided then, in the early 90s, foreign exchange was becoming a problem in Nigeria. So we saw an opportunity where you have to sell if you export. It still happens till today. 
you, you, you fill out a Form M when you're exporting, which means you have to bring the money back and sell it to the bank. Just think about it. If you look at today, the arbitrage, the bank rate, so if you exported this to the UK and you fill out a Form M and you got $10,000 from the import in the UK, he has to pay you back through your bank that you opened the Form M. And the bank will buy the money at the CBN rate, official rate. Government then made a rule that if you import with the money, if you import with the money to Nigeria, then you can utilize your funds. So that we saw the opportunity. So what we started doing is we started, we export and we started bringing in machineries. So we're talking things like bulldozers, cranes, uh, vehicles, trucks, tippers. So we used the money in Holland, second hand, started shipping those in. So we're making money twice. Right? And that was the opportunity. We even started bringing in clothes. We started a clothing store called Coda Collections as well. Then we go to these outlet stores and we ship in a lot of, then it was Calvin Klein jeans because there's no shops in Nigeria then. You know, back then, our time, what people did was, if you were traveling for the summer, we all grouped together and give you money, buy us some clothes in London. So that's the opportunity. So why I'm telling you this is, look and observe your environment. The opportunity could be staring you in the face, just around you. And what we did was we took opportunities that was available and built it into something. Fast forward, 1997, it was fantastic to do oil and gas. So we started an oil trading company. But you see, when people talk about oil trading, I'm glad you work in the industry. Most of us in the EMP part of the business, the Nigerians are only recent. And when I say recent, maybe 1999, 2000. The only company, there's an old company in EMP, Nigeria's Pan Ocean. All the companies you see today are as recent as 22, 23 years ago. What most of us were doing then was what they call trading. The story of most of the businesses you see here of in Nigeria today would not have been possible without the Nigerian financial institutions coming of age. 24, 25 years ago, to do a $100 million deal in Nigeria, you would have needed at least four, five, six banks to club together. So you see banks coming as a club, but today with the banking consolidation changed the dial for Nigeria. So Nigerian financial institutions today, some have single obligate limits of as high as $400 million. That's what changed our game. So that's when, if you go back 25 years, you started seeing Nigerian institutions playing the big game. It's important to note this because the survival of whatever you're trying to do, whatever ideas you come up with, you've got to think of sustainable financing that can make it work. But you're in time now because the world of global finance is very open now. Different sources of capital is available for your ideas. Hard work counts for 99%. That 1% rider is the luck. So that's the element of luck I'm talking about. I'm not saying, uh, wait there and think, yeah, I'm going to be lucky. It's not going to happen. Right? But this is the key. So let's step back in anything you try to do. First is dedication, focus, work hard, and have a plan and follow it through. But one thing I'm going to share with you that's prime in everything you do, be reliable. Be reliable. If you ask me what made the difference, my journey, reliability. See those older Egbons and co then, when there was a transaction and I had to deal with it for, with them, and there was 10 Naira, I came back with the 10 Naira. Be trustworthy. Because you know, that's your currency. Trustworthy. 
That is the most important currency you could own. You know why? Because what helped me was when other people wanted to do something, I had people selling me without being there. I just got a call, oh, Kola, I, I need to see you. X, Y, Z said I should talk to you about blah, 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 blah. Because through your journey of life, people test you. People try you just to see. Right? I walked in here and I had to apologize to you guys because reliability for me is not negotiable. When you say 7 o'clock, let it be 7 o'clock. It's very important. In business, in your private life, in everything you do, trust and reliability. The only thing you are in control of is the truth. If I tell you the truth and my mind is crystal clear that I am being truthful and genuine in the situation, but your perception or whatever views you hold is opposite, there's nothing I can do. So never lose sleep if you know deep down this is what it is. See, what I see with your generation is too worried about, ah, oh, John is thinking, ah, oh, Mary is thinking. If your mind is clear, don't lose sleep. Just keep on doing what you're doing because you know you're doing the right thing. I call your generation the, the gazelles because you want to run, you want to, you know, it's great. You want to conquer the world. But you're also very conscious of what other people think about you. It's crazy. But it's good because it checks you. But don't lose sleep if you're doing the right thing. Because, you know what? The whole world will not like you. Trust me. Fact. So if you live your life trying to please the world, you displease yourself. Just know you're doing what is right, what is just, and your conscience could defend it. And once that's what it is, fear not. Your beliefs in God and if that's your guiding principle, make it that. It's very important. Because you need spiritual upliftment as well. That's very important. Be you a Christian, be you a Muslim. You need it. Because it's never a straight road to Jericho. Be it in your business life. You've just come through a cycle of education. Marriage. It's never a straight road. But, very important, be true to yourself. Be true to your values. And be confident. So what I find is a lot of people lack self-confidence. The worst thing you can say to me, or you can say to me, or you can say to me, if I'm coming for a job, is either, yes, I like this guy or this girl, or no, we don't want you here. I say, thank you very much, goodbye, try the next one. Never be scared of failure, trust me. Life knocks you, pick yourself, move on. We're all going to go through it. Don't think it was all rosy. There were sleepless nights. There were sleepless nights. But I always use this formula. They can only say yes or no. I came for a job. You don't want me. I came for a contract to pitch. You don't want me. You can't arrest me. Right? <laughs> so I'm still a free person. I just go home and try again. But I've seen so many of your generation, you're so paranoid and upset and angry. You're only pulling yourself back because to prepare for the next one, you're already worried. Oh, maybe I don't want to say what I said. I upset them. No. Just be you. Never be worried about rejection. If this idea has not worked in a certain way, you pitched it to them, alter it to pitch it to them. Right? And if it does not work with them, alter it again to pitch it to them. Right? Don't give up. Be it in your relationship life, in your married life, in your work life, we're all going to be rejected one way or the other. You might like someone who does not like you, 
or someone likes you and you don't like them. You have a business deal, you're pitching to someone and you're thinking, yes, he's going to buy the idea. Then it comes to you, they reject you. But you know the true thing is have it, this do I deal with it. There's only going to be two outcomes in everything you do. Yes or no? Now your mind is prepared, the blow is not going to hurt that much. But you see, what we all do is be it a business transaction, be it a relationship. Oh my God, this is it. But you're not thinking for the other person. You're trying to have the answer for the other party. But she has not told you it is it. The bank has not told you it's done. The investors have not told you we're in. But you're already thinking, wow, because they were smiling. They've just been decent. Oh, because they had dinner with you. Oh, God, the guy's done. Then you've not prepared your mind. Right? So if you go in having that answer in your mind, it's either yes or no. And they've not told me any. So it's going to it that way. But I never get carried away that I'm not thinking yes or no behind my head. Do you see what I mean? But you need to build your self-belief that I know if I walk in there, if I present this, they're going to change to buying this than using that. But there's also that possibility they might have other commitments that I don't know. It's not because they don't like this. You see, I'll teach you a secret. Most of us self-apportion blame on why we got it wrong but believe you me, more often than not, it's not what you think. I'm coming here to sell you this water. It's not because you don't like my water, but you might have a commitment with Nestle. You might have a commitment with Coca-Cola already, but because you like it, this, you've got a contract that's expiring in two years. But I'm thinking of selling now. But I'm walking away from it. Oh, they don't like my water. Do you see what I mean? So never apportion blame thinking the reason I didn't get the job or the reason I didn't do the deal. I'll tell you what I encourage as an entrepreneur myself and having gone through the cycle, I'm 54 years old, having gone through the cycle of what you guys are just, the journey you're just about to embark on. What I tend to do is I encourage people. I never count anyone out. I never count anyone out. I spot talents, even on the road. I, we employed who today is one of our amazing staff in Abuja. I employed her at the airport. I met her at the airport. And again, another story. So why I'm telling you this, as an entrepreneur, be observant. Make sure your vicinity is important to you. Your environment is important to you because you just never know. As you're looking, other people are looking at you. It's about comportment. It's important on your journey. Your environment is important on your journey. People you talk to, people you meet, people you have to work with, irrespective of what circumstances you find yourself, someone pissed you off, upset you at home, don't take it out on people in the office. Someone upset you in the car, don't take it out on the guy at the door. Because you see, as you observe, people are observing you. It's very important. Your conduct, personal conduct, respect, be dignified in everything you do, it's always very important. Because you know what? Whatever you're going through, the people you're talking to didn't create it. <laughs> Why take it out on them? So on your journey, hold yourself together as you do that. Look, we decided early enough, and be observant, and I'm going to tell, share this with you. If you look at what we do, we're in several businesses, from construction to power, oil and gas upstream, oil and gas mis midstream, oil and gas services, real estate. And the reason for this is because I'm observant. And being observant means you can follow through what's happening in your environment. 
be observant, follow through what's happening in your environment. We went into oil and gas, EMP, upstream, what he does for a living. In 2009, just before, 2007, before President Obasanjo left government, there were problems in the Niger Delta, and there was a big push. The international oil companies were shutting down well because they were kidnapping people, the expats. But there's a reality that Nigeria was suffering, just like what's happening today. See, the international oil companies are very smart, and the accountants here know this. See, in the oil business, they report reserves on their global balance sheet. So when you look at Shell's balance sheet on London Stock Exchange, it says global reserves. So every reserve in Nigeria is there. So they've gotten value because it's priced into their stock, yes? But Nigeria as a nation state only makes money from royalties. That means you have to produce it. So what happens to the international oil companies, if they leave it there, they find it, leave it there, they've gotten value. That's why they announce a fine. But the state and the government of Nigeria will make zero from that. It's the barrel you produce, Nigeria gets royalty and taxes from it. So when we said this to government, and listen, these guys have got value, Nigeria's losing. So the president said, if you do not produce these fields, we're going to take it away from you. And that is what forced the so-called indigenization that they started selling assets to us. It's not because they love us. It's fact. That's what forced it. And that is how most of these local oil companies you see in Nigeria today, the Seplats, the Shorelines, Sahara, that's how we all started. In EMP. Because it was that forced, and we took advantage of that opportunity. Okay? So why I'm saying this, be observant of your environment. Because sometimes the environment kicks up opportunities. There's brilliance in this society. What it needs. And you see, look, there's something I talk about, leadership. The problem with the political leadership, and that's why, why I so believe in this generation, is uh, it's amazing how you're trying to work together and bring each other together. It's a good thing. The problem of Nigeria is, is failed leadership. Because the common man in a society like Nigeria is amazing, does not want too much. I kid you not. Think about it. Your driver is on 70, 80 K. He has three kids. He has a wife. He has a roof over his head. All the system needs to provide for him. That's all. So if we can gather together to do that, can you imagine how the society is going to thrive? This is what it is. So the social ability in making people feel they belong so think of yourself as leaders, and all you need to do is provide that base. And that's all. Don't think you're going to be a hero. No. Understand the system. Try work with the system with your own integrity. Right? I see a lot of people want, ah, yes, the policeman is asking for money. I'm not going to give him. I'll fight him. The guy's got a gun. So be smart. Don't be stupid. Right? The policeman is pissed, is drunk, he's asking you for money, and you say, no, because I've got this social, you're going to kill yourself. Right? So live within the confines of the society you are from. Have your integrity, but be smart and be responsible to doing things. The humanity in us means we all need to try and come together, corral each other, and try and help each other. And that's what makes a better society. And that's why I think your generation, hopefully, you see, the biggest change to the world is this. 
This is amazing. Back then in England, you waited for letters from home. They wrote you a letter three weeks before it gets to London. Today, your mother, your school, your work. Hello, darling, are you okay? <laughs> it's amazing. So that's the power. Utilize the tool. And that's why your social connection and contact is so powerful. But in transforming that also, your economic contact and power, prowess, equally could be powerful. That's why you can see a Facebook emerge. Became a global phenomenon. Twitter. Right? Global phenomenon. I'll tell you something that I was thinking about the other day that I, I don't know, and I think I, I, as we go along, it's this, um, you know, during the pandemic, everyone was getting onto that news that everyone's talking and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, the world is open again and no one, not many people on it. What's it called again? Clubhouse. Clubhouse. Yeah. In an environment workspace, people, character matters. And as a leader, as an entrepreneur, always file things away that people tell you. Don't be reactive immediately. Watch, because some people might try to set you up. And just watch. That's the true leadership. See, Nigeria failed and is failing because we're all responsible. If you look at the, six, well, the 60s, when the colonial powers left and were leaving Nigeria, they didn't just hop, pack their bags. They came, they went to the office of establishment, and people got jobs. But you see, unfortunately, what happened over time is because of the bastardization of the civil service. See, the civil service in every society is the engine room that drives that society. Let me repeat. The civil society is the engine room that drives that society. So if you're an entrepreneur and your business is importing biscuits, the civil guy in the civil service that's responsible for customs and excise, if it's not a thinker like you, then what are you expecting? Let me shock you. Your generation, who do you know that's joined the Ministry of Justice? The Ministry of Justice. Justice. We are the problem. Because you see, how do you expect fairness and justice if you, the learned, and the blessed and the opportuned, and the exposed and not the ones there? And this is the problem I want you to take away today. Look, for Nigeria to continue as a nation state of equal prosperity for all, we must all be prepared to make the sacrifices. Let me go down this way. I have friends of my generation who when we came back here, we were trying to be entrepreneurs. Their family chose, okay, you, you go to Ministry of Justice. You studied law, Ministry of Justice. You go to the police. Unfortunately, Nigeria's far gone into the abyss of bad manners. It's crawled everywhere in our system. That trying to get an appointment, you have to set for someone. Just think about that. But you see, remember where we started. The social norms, we've got to try and make it right. Because if it is right, then that guy who's hustling to make that extra buck will probably not have to. Right? People say equal pay, right? But reality is in a society where there's no equality, you get lapses like this. And there's structural lapses. Because, again, I want you to think, a man on 50,000 naira a month as a salary, what are you expecting? Just be just in your mind, 50 grand. So this is the thing. But I see more of your generation, the way you could capture that leading light is some of you needs to start thinking about 
the system. The biggest problem in Nigeria is Nigerians. Kid you not. Ah, that place. Ah. But you know what I find bizarre? Yet yeah, this guy lives in Peckham. <laughs> <laughs> and he says the worst things about Nigeria. Are you thinking, I beg your pardon? But this is, this is the problem. Let's stop demarketing our country. Look, I, I, I say this uh, openly, and I, I feel very, very upset about it. Kemi Badenoch, right? When she was running for office, I felt really upset when this lady stood up and demarketing Nigeria. You're not running to be anything in Nigeria. Did you hear any of the Asian origin people talk about, oh, in India they were taking bribes? No, that's wrong. This is a Nigerian problem. She said, oh, when I grew up in Nigeria, things are so bad. What is the British public business with that? Tell them what you've got to offer them. Did you hear Rishi Sunak talk about India? No. So this is the big Nigerian problem. We demarket our own country. Let's stop it. Right? You, we, every Nigerian should be a salesman for Nigeria. I don't say sugarcoat it. India is not a bed of roses. Have you been to India? Good Lord. <laughs> right? I have not seen abject poverty like I saw there in India. And I've been many times. But I have never seen any Indian politician stand on a dais, demarket in India. So why should we do that? And I take this serious. Because the more of us who talk, we don't sugar paint anything. But look at the positives of this country. Then people will take us serious. It's the Nigerian who get, ah, those people, ah, that country. That's key. Right? Be an ambassador of your nation. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. Nigeria, we have pockets of brilliance everywhere in the world. If you look at the dynamics of this country, 60% is under the age of 30. You have the power. There are three major silos in every developing economy. Nigeria being the largest economy in Africa, if you follow the tricks of the three silos, you'll find a pocket. And be you an entrepreneur, be you uh, an academic, whatever. And the first one I call is the financial services silo. You've seen the transition and the buildup of the financial services in Nigeria. Just think about the gaps of the unbanked. That's an opportunity. Think about the gaps of lack of insurance, another opportunity. Think about the gaps of what fintech can transform, big opportunity, and more and more around financial services, inclusion. And that's where you see the flutter waves and all these guys, and there will be many more. With this new uh, thing from Central Bank, it even makes it bigger. Oh, this managed cash, cashless yeah. thing, right? So Mama Arisi is now got to use a POS. Accelerates it. Yeah. Opportunities, guys. The entrepreneurs around the table. Right? Yeah. So think about the financial services silo, which pockets you can plug in. Then the second one is the infrastructure, deficits and gaps silo. Huge. Right? So those who are in PE looking at pockets of small power plants, what you're trying to do, uh, construction here and there, housing deficit, this infrastructure and construction silo, big deficit. Opportunities. I know young people started from developing two duplexes. They're now doing four, eight, selling in Lecky. <laughs> That's the opportunity. That's the infrastructure gap silo. Then the last one is FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods. Right? I've seen a lot of young people now starting to make yams in packs, jollof rice in buckets. Do you see what I mean? Gaps. Create a business from it. You have 200 million people here, ready-made to feed. What I found that's amazing, in New York, a pack of uh, coconut, sugar-coated coconut from Nigeria. It's amazing. 
cashew nuts. Packed. It's amazing. FMCG, huge boom. Financial services, infrastructure, FMCG. Plug into any of those buckets, you're flying. And that is the future of where entrepreneurship and opportunities collide. Not many countries have that. And Nigeria is blessed with tons of it. So my advice to you all is get out there, energize, innovate, work, talk, be truthful, be focused, be dedicated, and be ready to share with, you, with each other. The sky's the limit. Look, first, my advice to you is marry your friend. Marry your friend. Someone who you know will remain friends with you. The beauty you see today, once you have two or three kids, is not the same. But friendship stays. Your life being married becomes different because you or both of you are working to pay the bills. Because with your friend, irrespective of being your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you have friendship to talk about things. It's very important. Look, my wife studied banking and finance. She moved back here and we got married in 97. And uh, two years after, I said, listen, you've got to pack in your work because someone, we had two kids by 2000. And it's tough. I'm gone. You know, one day in Amsterdam, the next week. And it's difficult. Young, 25, 26-year-old, two kids are thinking, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? Right? So first, you need friendship. And in 2001, I said, look, just pack in the job. I think I can make enough to keep us going. She didn't even think twice or argue. That's friendship, again. Someone said, no, I'm going to give up my career because of you, blah, blah, blah. But she did. Right? So you need to be in a position to talk. It's a long road. There's no straight answer. And that's why I start from friendship to talk. And you can discuss things. And that's what it is. But you must all be prepared, right? It's a mountain you have to climb. And you must open yourself up to being able to talk about things, about plans, about your ambition, fears also. Because what if the business fails? What are we going to do? Right? So it's a very valid question, but there's no straight answer. But friendship is the key to the answer. Because if you have friendship, you could deal with anything together. All right? and, and it gets more complicated when the kids come. Because you're not deciding for two people, you're deciding for three or four. Right? So you've got to roll up your sleeves and be there to do it. But um, Look, it, it's, it's, I hope it's been um, interesting, but definitely for me, it's been wonderful meeting you all and um, sharing this time with you, uh, especially this period, is a period to reflect and be joyous um, and to count our blessings that we're blessed, right? In a country, in a nation where there's so much, yet we have so much to be thankful for. That counts for something. And, you know, to everyone who's been part of your journey thus far, starting from your parents, your grandparents, friends, family, hold those as part of your learning journey. But never fear asking for help. Never fear speaking out. And I've seen a lot of young people going to depressive spasms. Um, talk. You know, because if you bottle everything, you're human, right? You break. Speak. If you're going through anything, talk about it. Find one or two sounding boards if you can't talk to your parents. Find a mentor that you could bounce ideas, share things, and talk to them about it. Because we all need that shoulder. We need that you know, pillar support. And, and that's because it's a rat race in this country, like in most places, so everyone's just go, go, go. 
But what's important is, you know, your self-belief. You're being clinical in your thought process in what you want and what you do not want. What you are and who you are not. And once you know that, you have your own values that you live with. Get on with life. So, I, I hope all that we've shared tonight means maybe a teeny win a bit is added to your baseline know-how and knowledge. But what always, always drives me is what I've shared with you in frank openness and, and being direct, right? There's no free lunch, right? There's no free lunch. You know something? If it's too good to be true, take this with you. The possibility is it's not true. And I'm going to leave you with another one. In my business life, if I do not know someone that knows you or someone that knows the person that knows you, I am not doing business with you. I repeat it. If I do not know you or I do not know someone that knows you, so there's a connection. It could be two, three, four away. I'm not doing business with you. And with that, I can only say this to all of you. I wish you all the very best that you wish yourself. Because you've got to wish your, make your wishes first, right? So let me say, I wish you luck. No, 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 no. You make the wishes. But you make your own luck, right? And, and get out there and ride the back of a line because you will be successful, God willing. Right? In every career, you're doing the right thing, I must say, by coming together. It shows camaraderie. It shows friendship. And that's important. Some of you probably just met each other. Right? I know that. But it just shows you have something, determination, fire, and burning. Right? And with that, I have no doubt the success is all yours. So I want to wish you all the very, very best of luck. Your families, the very, very best. And, you know, just remember, sky's the limit. Reach out and touch, and you could do it. All right? Never let anyone fool you. It's never easy. But once you're ready to ride, remember, 99% roll up hard work, 1% luck, and that you pray for. And my prayer for you all is God Almighty will bless you with hard work and bless you with the luck to ride it through as well.